Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. So, guys, I'm so excited to have Christian Watson on the channel today. I think we're going to have a really amazing talk about his experiences encountering critical race theory directly in an academic environment, because a lot of times when we're thinking about critical race theory, you know, someone like me or like, you know, James Lindsay writes about it from an academic perspective. We're thinking about it in ways that we necess aren't necessarily directly involved in that moment. But Christian has had some experiences where he's experienced the ramifications of it and is going to share those with us. So let me introduce Christian. I got his bio up right here. Christian Watson Excellent. is the yeah, Christian Watson is the host of Pensive Politics Podcast, a YouTuber, a political writer, and a student of philosophy. His work has been in, featured in USA Today, The Washington Examiner, The Advocate Magazine, The Washington Times, among many others. He's interviewed numerous figures on his podcast, such as Nobel Peace Prize nominee Joshua Wong, 2020 Libertarian presidential candidate Joe Jorgensen, international wrestling champion, champion and current Knox County Mayor Kane, also known as Glenn Jacobs. I'm actually really jealous of you over that particular interview. <laughs> His YouTube yeah. channel and podcast features regular and relevant philosophically inspired political commentary from a libertarian, conservative, conservative, conservatarian perspective. And I have all of his information if you want to follow him on Twitter, Facebook, his YouTube channels, his podcasts, all in the description below. Welcome, Christian. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here, Dr. Borshenko. Seriously, I am. Oh, okay. I've watched you a lot. Yep. No, go ahead. Yeah, no, I watch you a lot. I mean, almost every day, you're one of my favorite commentators on YouTube, and I'm just, you know, I'm just sincerely happy to be able to share this story with you. And I do call you Dr. Borshenko because you uh, are. I, I, I was just going to say, please don't call me Dr. Borshenko. You're going to give me a complex. Like, we can call Okay, like, okay, you can be, you can okay. Be Christian, I will be Carlin for the purpose of this okay. podcast. All right. I do I do appreciate you being open to the honorific instead of making a nonsense <laughs> issue out of it. We're not going to go there. I'll get paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't, no, want, you no. don't want any of that. But listen, I no. want to just kind of open it up and, and, and get a little bit of uh, your background and your experience here and why this is an important topic for you. Well, where do I start? So I'm a junior in college right now, which I mean, I know I look much older, but I get that all the time. <laughs> but I'm a junior in college right now. And I... So I had, I first experienced something with the subject matter when I was a freshman in college. I was a, I always was someone who had his eyes in the, on the sky, his head in the clouds, so to speak, a very idealistic kind of lad. And that idealism drove me directly to get involved in collegiate debate. And because I, you know, I, I have a, I have a passion for ideas, and that's why I study philosophy, even though it can be very dense and hard sometimes. It's worth it when you really get down to the end of it. In fact, I mean, I was actually reading Kierkegaard uh, a few days ago. And just how he conceptualized everything from faith and, you know, it just made me smile. It made me realize that, you know, there's a lot in this world that is not immediately apparent to us in our initial perceptions. But we actually can grasp if we actually take up time to delve into the minds of some of the greatest thinkers in the world. Uh, or even some people who are not considered the greatest thinkers but may have valuable thoughts anyway. Uh, and so that's what drove me, and that drove me to clue the debate. I had no clue the nexus of leftism in, in academic like, like academic slavishness that I was entering like seriously I am to this day I am still thunderstruck by what I experienced and so the first day I walked into the debate coach's office I said well you know I like Kant I like Ayn Rand and he's like Ayn Rand and his eyes just went wide I'm like, is, is, is that something bad? But, you know, he, he said, you're a very smart lad. You, know, you can be on the team. So, I thought, you know what? He just has something against Iran. That's that's fine. I don't agree with that. That's fine. I mean, all thinkers have their flaws, and that's that's okay. And you can have something against people, I guess. But I didn't know that that moment actually conveyed to me the sense of the entire team and what I would experience for a good majority of my duration there. Uh, so uh, when I went to my first debating uh, championship, the first debating tournament, my partner actually bailed on me. I, but debating is a team effort. He bailed on me, and so I had I went there, and it was at it was in Valdosta, Georgia, and I did the entire tournament. I'm not trying to brag or anything; I'm just telling you what happened. I won the entire tournament by myself. Uh, and but the topics that were at the tournament, <laughs> thank you. The topics at the tournament were kind of very disturbing. Um, they were like, oh, should we endorse the Black Panthers' 12 point plan to for, further the Black community, or should we do this or that? And Regardless of what side one was on, you would hear leftist arguments. You would hear arguments mired in critical race theory. So when I got back from that tournament, I talked to one of my other coaches. I'm like, you know, dude, uh, I, I, these arguments are a little bit too 
identitarian for me. They're a little bit too collectivist for me. I'm not sure I can handle this. You know, I'm good fit. I'm not sure I can argue these things. In- uh, and we actually spent seven hours arguing about this. One of the student coaches about uh, me being involved in a case that would uh, postulate a, a critical theory idea um, called uh, the state of exception, which basically for your listeners, if they're not aware, it's basically a theory uh, made by a uh, Carl Schmidt, who was a uh, Nazi jurist. And that came out through the, the ages to go towards a Gorgio Agamben, who is an Italian academic who follows Foucault is a Foucaultian scholar. And it basically says that, that the sovereign has the ability to su- suspend power. The sovereign being a president, a politician, to suspend power and assume control over life and the processes of life and create a state of exception to the rule of law. And I didn't feel comfortable arguing this idea because it was mired in Foucaultian theory. It was mired in seeing everything in society as a mixture of power dynamics and privilege and stations. And I didn't feel comfortable arguing that. So we argued for all these hours, like, well, Christian, this happens. This happens. I'm like, you think it happens because you're divining this thing into reality. But when all reality, a process like this does occur, but it occurs in a different way. You know, you know, and that's when I really found the issue with critical race theory. It reduces everything to a single quality. And when you do that, you're being fundamentally unscientific, un- unphilosophical. You are just doing everything in the book that is incorrect if you're trying to actually get to a point of genuine knowledge production. And I kept going up against these arguments simply. And I actually lost a lot of tournaments because I wouldn't kowtow to this leftist critical race theory stuff. And a lot of people on the team actually ran cases that were inherently tied to their identity and their identity's relation to power. So, for example, there was a team on the debate team that would that ran a black feminism case. Well, we're being kind of we're being commodified because stores give us um, beauty products for our hair, and we're being treated as as if we're commodities. Well, is it possible that maybe a lot of black women in, or a lot of women in general like hair supplies and therefore a store tries to cultivate a market? Is that possible? I mean, does it have to be something? Uh, is, is that possible? N- apparently not. Apparently everything has to be about this power and privilege falsehood. And there was a case that, you know, ran, there were two LGBTQ folks on the team. I'm, I'm LGBTQ as well. I'm gay. But, you know. They were running a simple, simple kind of case. Well, I'm we're gay and we're trans, and this inter- and this colors how I interact with all of society, and therefore uh, we need to you need to affirm my identity by giving me the ballot, by giving me a yes vote. But like, seriously, this kind of stuff, and they, they would actually treated argue me, that that, that, they're, that? They're, that they would actually argue that they they, they they their identity needed to be affirmed through a yes vote. Yes. Oh yeah. Wow. That, that actually. And the thing is, well, there was actually one time in McKendry, Illinois, we had, this is my last tournament, actually. There was one time where a judge, was, and all judges typically are very leftist themselves. The, the judge was like, look, you guys put me in a very difficult situation because it was the ones who wanted their identities to be affirmed by a yes vote. And there was a case about disability rights and how disabled people are apparently oppressed. And so she's like, you know what? I care very deeply about these demographics and you're putting me in a very precarious position by doing this. And I feel so bad right now. I'm thinking to myself, lady, you are not supposed to be so materially invested into the, you're supposed to t- make a detached and partial judgment on the basis of arguments, whether they're true or false, whether they're presented good or not. But instead, you have immersed yourself into these individuals' personal lives because they have presented it, and you are now making yourself feel bad about this. This is the mindset. This is the framework of collegiate debate, most unfortunately. And so my, I would run libertarian conservative cases. I'd be quoting William F. Buckley or Robert George or some other conservative intellectual because, you know, that's just, that's just who I am. I am someone, you know, I'm a very, uh, I, I adhere to tradition when tradition helps me in my own life. But now if it doesn't help me in my own life, I move beyond it, which is why I call myself a conservatarian because I am, I do recognize that liberty plays a very big role in that. Um, but they couldn't handle those arguments or they didn't like those arguments. And so I was referred to in a lot of ways in silence by my, by my uh, debating peers with a lot of uh, very disparaging remarks. So let me give you an example. One time we were prepping as a team. Uh, we had ordered fried chicken and everything. I love fried chicken personally. It's just, it's, it's, it's excellent. Who doesn't like fried chicken? <laughs> you know, prepping as a team. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, 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 it's really excellent. As a team, and we were in a library room. And the conversation of systemic racism came up. Personally, I'm just going to give my views so you probably can divine them. I don't think that claims of systemic racism 
um, that many people are making, that many academics are making, are as widespread and deep-rooted into the American system as folks think. I think individual racism certainly prevails. I Well, it exists in many areas. Um, but is the entire system, from everything from hospitals to home lenders to police to judges, are all of them all participating in this, this what leftists would call this curse of whiteness? Of course. No, no. And to say so is to itself engage in a racist, collectivistic idea of what that stuff is. And I don't, that's disgusting. Uh, but we got into a conversation about that. And I said, look, can you produce material evidence of this systemic racism? Can you tell me how these systems hold you down materially in your life? They said to me, one of them said to me, you know what, Christian, I won't repeat, I won't repeat the exact word he said. When you walk out of off this campus, those police, they see you as an as an N word, and he's black himself. They see you as an N word. Yeah, yeah, they, they they see you as that, and to them, you're just an N word. So no matter how much I stick up to them, you are simply an N word. I'm like, okay, dude, you can keep trying to claim things about me that are not true, but I follow that divine adage that Walt Walter Emerson said in Self Reliance that I have to 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 toil on my own plot of land. That I am a unique individual, and I will let that come forth. I will not be bound to a historical perception of me that existed a very long time ago in material forms. I will make my own destiny. I will manifest my own destiny, whether you like it or not. And what what they do about that? They they didn't like that because I didn't buy into the victim class idea. Mm-hmm. And so this was. The be- near the beginning of the end of my time in collegiate debate, I was just being assailed by all these very pernicious ideas. And they're pretty, like, these, these are academics, they're not smart ideas, but they're pretty elaborate. They're pretty systematized. So like, for example, there's an idea like called Afro-pessimism, in which all things in society are critiqued through the lens of what an African is supposed to think. Oh, colonialism, oh this, oh that. And these are just extended throughout time to mean something about contemporary events. It's, this is something that many critical theorists like to do all the time. So, so let, me, let, me, let me ask you a question about that because yeah. I just want to make sure I understand. So there is a standard definition of what an African should think about an issue. And how was that definition developed? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, yes, there is. There is. Yeah, of course. And so, and look, when you operate in critical race theory terms, you don't really have, the individual does not exist. You exist as a class, as a certain demographic. So yes, there is a certain idea of how people are supposed to think if they're not, if they're not participating in white supremacy, so to speak. I mean, I I saw Cornell West, uh, the the famous academic, leftist academic, say a few days ago that uh, oh yes, I mean women can participate in patriarchy and white supremacy. They do it. They do it all the time. And I'm like, huh? So like, how how do you qualify that, Cornell? I mean, he's a smart guy. I was like, how do you qualify that, dude? I don't understand you. But this is the standard thinking in critical race theory. It's about I mean, Kimberly Crenshaw, who kind of founded it back in the 80s and 90s, I believe, she said that, as an example, we should engage in intersectional thinking and critically analyze that through systems of power and privilege. So basically, if, in her words, if a black woman has a trouble in a high school or whatever, we shouldn't recognize that in isolation as a problem that she has personally, but as the intersection between her. Her being black, her being a woman, and her being in a kind of environment which may or may not, in her words, perpetuate white supremacy. So they are reducing everyone's individual ex- – it's crazy. Everyone's individual experiences to a, a, a bout of historical circumstances that may or may not be affecting them in the real world. So wrapping up here because I know I've been talking for a very long time. Uh, I eventually just – I was like – I eventually just decided that I was going to – I was going to stay with the team – but I was going to show in a manner that is vivaciously and uniquely and authentically me. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to be anyone's story to write. I'm going to write my own story. Um, so one person on the team, I, we were in Illinois, and this person was a little bit belligerent with me, a little bit aggressive with me in circumstances that were not related to debate or politics. And they took this because of their critical race theory beliefs. They took me kind of defending myself in a polite way, a stern way, but a polite, polite way, as me viewing them as a woman, they were non, they're not the non-binary, me viewing them as a woman and therefore being misogynistic to them and erasing their identities. And that caused the entire team. I'm like, well, hold on, hold on. I have used your pronouns. I have respected you as a human being, but you conceive, A, that I see you as a woman because I am kind of pushing back when you interrupt my conversation with the people, and B, you're assuming that I hate women. So you're making two flawed assumptions that 
don't stand up to scrutiny and you're using them and you're running with them and you're crying and you're making the entire team except one person delve into your delusion. But of course, I try to be agreeable. I try to apologize. Again. But this is how they think. This is genuinely how they think. And so there came a point in time where the coach stopped scheduling me for tournaments. Me, me and my partner. My partner was also. She was from Nepal. She she actually knows what it's like to be poor and oppressed. I mean, over the and she is as conservative as they come. She loves America and everything. She loves liberty. And seriously, and I'm like, well, you 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 would not. I would not conceptualize you as having these beliefs if I believed in these massive leftist ideas. If I believed in these collectivistic ideas, I wouldn't conceptualize you having these beliefs. And they basically stopped scheduling us. And the, they claim, oh, it was not for discrimination or anything. But when we left the room that day after they stopped scheduling us, because she walked out crying and I was a little bit sad as well, everyone in the team, even the coaches, were like, we don't want Christian back. We don't want them wow. back. We don't want them back. We don't want them back. We don't want them back. And you know why? Because a few weeks before that moment, I hosted, I run a student organization on my campus. I hosted a social justice debate, a debate between two academics in an academic setting who have different views on social justice. In fact, your viewers can go watch it up on the on YouTube. I'll be sure to send you a link if they ever want to watch. I host that debate. I organize it and everything. And the team, the debate team being composed of so many leftists didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to talk about that. They didn't want, they, and they were, they all of them were there. And when, after the, the event ended, I said, you guys like the event? You're like, I mean, he was saying some offensive stuff, Christian. And the professor about social justice, he basically said that, you know, African-Americans commit a lot of crimes and that could be an explainer for social, uh, for, for the social inequalities, as opposed to talking about social justice. And that's a fine, I mean, that's a fine claim. I mean, it, it, it there are there is a disparate committing of crimes amongst African Americans. It's not racist to say that. I mean, it's it, it just it happens. It's it's a, it's a statistical fact. It's an empirical fact. But they lambasted him for saying that, and they looped me in to what he said, and they used that to attack me personally. So all in all, critical race theory has done more than just been a abstract academic practice. This has been a very grueling, a very painful. Um, notion, a very painful ideology, which has deprived me of an activity that I love and has consumed collegiate debate as a whole into this sort of miasma, this nexus of incoherent babble. And so I am, I, it's unfortunate and its consequences are matriculating beyond college campuses, unfortunately. Well, and it, the whole thing just makes me so incredibly sad because you are obviously a very intelligent, very, very, very well-spoken person who's thought through this, has spent, spent some time thinking through these issues, weed, reading a, a wide variety of thinkers, coming to your own conclusions. It seems as though you are exactly the type of person who should be successful in college debate. You you know what arguments to do. You know how to argue things. Um, I mean, it just it makes it makes me so sad because the collegiate debate is a place where you should like by very definition, you're supposed to argue issues issues right? right and it just like what you're telling me right now is that differences of opinion around like uh whether or not to take an argument with critical race theory or not is literally not allowed you in order to be successful in collegiate debate you have to argue based on the merits of your skin color or your sexual orientation or your gender and i mean it's especially annoying to me because you know you fit into at least two of their of their <laughs> categories i mean you've, you've only shared the two with us i don't know maybe you fit into some more but like you are you are one of the people by their very definition that they would say you are oppressed yes absolutely and that's why they can't shake look and, and this is uh the great td jakes who was a good minister in my opinion a good thinker he said that when someone conceptualizes you and puts you in a box they cannot think of you outside of that box it's a way for someone to grasp you if you're too deep of a person or you were too alien of a person to someone, even if not even even if they're not deep, if you're too alien of a person, they're going to do what they need to do. And they're your psychologist, of course. So you, you're you familiar with this. They're going to do what they need to do to understand you. And that means classifying you with a bunch of precepts or a bunch of labels that they can better understand than who you actually are. They'll do. And by doing that, they're actually erasing who you are at, and sacrificing that at the altar of understanding, or at least of ignorant understanding, so to speak. But yeah, yeah. no, this is exact same thing. Yeah. And that's why they are doubly offended. Oh my, you're gay and you're black and you're saying all this. How dare you do these cardinal sins of dissent? How dare you? That's why they were doubly offended. 
Right. But well, I mean, what yeah. does it mean for them? I mean, if we think about it from a psychological perspective, it's kind of it's it's actually really really simple. What does it mean for them if you, a gay black libertarian, I'm just gonna say conservatarian, but but like libertarian, if like if you're, yeah. you're like a fan of Rand, um, what does it say to them that you completely reject? their specific ideology but you are supposed to be the one that that they're trying to help with their ideology the the saviors with the critical race theory ideology because you're you can't obviously defend for yourself i mean if they accept that is true then their entire worldview falls apart everything falls precisely apart. you you are offensive to their entire fucking conception Ooh, i swore because higher succession no of, you're right you're right hey. the world you know yeah this is this, this situation is not to make me swear i swear i mean my <laughs> god no oh jesus i've had to stop myself a few times because i like I, I wanted to th trust me there were times where i wanted to just completely unleashed but i'm like you know what christian breathe breathe let, let air in air out don't let them get you because that is what they wanted to do yeah and so and you mentioned offense that is the bulwark behind which a lot of these people shield themselves. They will say, oh, this is offensive. So imagine PC culture, but PC culture backed up by academic theories, which link people's individual individual identities or whatever to broader things, which makes it even more offensive. So like, makes, makes it even more effective in their way. So example, if you say that well i don't think as a that, that you are being commodified as a black woman when someone tries to sell you a hair product because a lot of women in general regardless of the skin color tend to buy hair products they will say oh you're erasing my lived experience so they're engaging relativism number one and b by doing that you are invalidating me as a being not only is this offensive it is deadly and of course when you link everything as critical race theory does going back to that that, that, that foul idea with power and privilege your existence becomes just that. If you have less power in this world or you're presumed to have less power in this world by virtue or by vice of your identity, you will have the ability under that framework to claim certain things that others cannot. Why do you think whenever a white person says, I don't think systemic racism is a thing as much as you do, they're attacked? Right. Why do you think? That's precisely the reason. They're said, uh, or I mean, even the abortion argument is kind of the same thing. Why do you think when some when someone who is not a woman says, "Hey, I think abortion is not right," they're said the woman says, "Oh no, you're a woman. How, you're not one. How can you say that?" It all goes back to the idea of being a part of a class and being linked in with power and privilege. And regardless of what you think of those arguments, this is the same methodology that they're using. So it's disappointing. Now, I want to just go back and I want to get a little bit more of your personal history because you you said that this was like when you went and talked to the debate coach and you mentioned that you like ran and he was like, oh, like this was this was a surprise for you. It was a surprise what you found in collegiate debate. Is, is it had you not encountered men, like mentalities like this before you entered college? That's a good question. Um, I have heard of them. I heard of them. I mean, I, I was a child of the YouTube era. I was a child of the digital era. So I watched a lot of YouTube. I watched, I read a lot of stuff. I had heard of them, certainly. Um, and I had seen them in a very detached sense. But had I encountered very radical leftist, you know, ideas, like inherently, like personally before that? Not really. I Not not person to person, but I had heard of them, certainly. I mean, I had been reading a lot of leftists for a very long time. Um, I had been listening to all the leftists for a very long time, too. Uh, but in my high school, before college, most people didn't care about this stuff. Uh, most people were just like, you know, what, what what grade can I give you so you can get by? And that that's why high school was bad was a bad time for me, by the way. That's another story. <laughs> it's just like, it was a terrible time for me. Uh, bad time for everyone. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Most folks didn't care about that. They cared about, okay, grades, and we'll go to the party on the weekend, we'll go to the prom, and that's just, that's the kind of thing. It's less serious. But when you get to academia, academia is where this crap is being excreted from. That's where this crap is just being tossed out from, seriously. So when you get to academia, not only is it the breeding, it also is kind of, in a sense, it is the staging platform for these ideas to go into the world. Why do you mean... This is a reason why, over the course of the summer, um, Black Lives Matter was energized by a lot of academic assent because a lot of the theories they were using come straight from critical race theory, straight from mm -hmm. it. And so, I mean, no, I hadn't really faced something like this on this level until now. 
You know, I heard someone say once, and I, I, I completely forget where, like, who said it. So if, if anyone knows in the chat who said this quote, um, but I think it's really apropos. You know, Andrew Breitbart said that politics is downstream from culture, right? Well, yep. culture yep. is downstream from academia. Mm -hmm. And so oh, yeah. now we're, oh, yeah. we're getting like, what, what's going on, the crazy nonsense that you're talking about that is literally taken over academia. Now we're seeing that really infused into the culture. And frankly, it's coming out of academia and going into the high schools and the middle schools and the, the elementary schools so yep. that they can even get them even sooner, which is frankly the most terrifying thing that I'm thinking about right now, because I don't know how to solve that particular problem, because where are the teachers right. trained? They're trained in academia. And so right. like, like, so what like what were your first thoughts when this started kind of hitting you in the face? You, you understood it theoretically because you watched a lot of YouTube and you had been thinking about these things. And then all of a sudden you're experiencing it. What was that like for you? I felt alienated. I felt isolated. I felt alone. And I also felt energized too. But you know what? The alienation is one thing, but there is an entire crop of arguments I hadn't even ever considered in my life. I had considered surface level talking point versions of these arguments, but I had never considered the deep theoretic arguments they were making. And so now, not only is it incumbent upon me in my alienation to act against this tide, it's incumbent upon me to find ways to counter this tide, which is one of the reasons why I'm, I want to be a political commentator, because I think that you have. These I you have because these ideas are bleeding into the mainstream. You're not going to see uh, CNN or, or Fox News debate with someone saying, you know, someone postulating critical theory and all the all the, the deep depths of it. You're not going to see that, but you will see a talking head go on who is influenced by that stuff and will tout things about uh, systemic racism and, and inequalities, all of which their thinking is framed by critical race theory language. And so, me being hit in the face with all this kind of made me realize, oh God, there is there are a lot of students like me who deal with the same thing, conservative students are genuinely some of the most silenced on college campuses. In fact, statistically, conservative students, according to the College Fix, um, do not feel as if they can express their, their views in the classroom or outside of the classroom. They're trying to make, in one of these colleges, they're trying to make the College Republicans a hate group. Oh, I, I, I mean, that. That's like the it, it, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. So, I mean... I do consider my on the conservative side. I do. I do. I mean, because, you know, there are things that libertarians, some libertarians say that I don't think, you know, I can't take this to the full extreme. But, you know, that individualism is a very important thing to me. A very important thing to me. That's why I call myself a conservatarian. But even that ideology, I mean, the, see, the, the thing is, leftists tend to be okay with some applications of libertarianism. But when you begin saying, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-life. Oh, no, I think that, you know, the government shouldn't be providing all these programs. Oh, no, I don't you know your his your a, a a historical event that happened to people of your skin color identity affects you today in a material way? Oh no, they begin saying, "Are you libertarian?" I'm like, "Uh huh, I sure as hell am. I sure as hell am. I'm trying to I'm trying to get you to recognize how free you are inherently, but you keep binding yourself to these enslavements, these mental enslavements, these spiritual enslavements, these moral enslavements. You keep destroying your potential by doing this crap." By saying this crap, and of course, I say, Well, you're invalidating my experience. No, 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 I am invalidating the way you perceive your experience. That's what I'm doing. You need that. Everyone needs a bitter pill every now and then if they're going to be able to wake up and do things productively. So, too much of a, of, of a, of a struggle once I realized, Hey, Christian, your experience right now. A lot of other folks are experiencing it, and you can amplify your voice by going on YouTube, by writing all these places, and you can make a material change. I'm happy that I'm able to do that with you right here now. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy you're here too. And guys, I would definitely encourage you again to subscribe to Christian's channel. The information is in the, the description below. I have a feeling he's got a lot of important things to tell us on his channel that, and someone that we should be paying attention to moving forward. I also just want to take this quick moment to say that if you're enjoying this chat so far and we still have a ways left to go, but please hit that like button so that YouTube knows that we're doing good work here and we're exploring ideas that other people should watch. It really does help me out and I greatly appreciate it. So Christian, you just said something really interesting that I just 
just want to talk about for a second because you said that you know essentially when when people are getting into this ideology they're basically getting in their own way by by convincing themselves that they're oppressed they're not going to be able to be successful because of what class they're in all this stuff i used to tell this to women all the time anytime i would do like organizational training i would always get inevitably get a question um, um from from a woman in the room to say well carlin how can women overcome the stereotypes in corporate america and my answer to them was always like stop worrying about the stereotypes stop playing into the stereotypes stop convincing yourself that men are not going to listen what to what you say because you are a woman if you go into a room and think that you are oppressed and no one wants to hear from you and your voice doesn't matter well guess what you're not going to show up and you're not going to be able to present with the amount of confidence that you need to you need to let go of these ideas that no one wants to hear from you because you work there someone wanted to hear from you so just own it, own who you are. And that to me, it seems to be right. like the same message that you were trying to send to people. And they were just completely closed off to hearing it because guess what? It, it's scary to go after what you want. And it's much easier to do it when you have a way to explain why you weren't successful. That is not, I screwed this up and I could do it differently. It's just a complete lack of taking personal responsibility for your experience so far as I'm concerned. Oh, absolutely. And so and this is actually a very, very important point. I human beings don't like pain. Typically, that's we don't like, we try to eschew pain in many different places. And whether you believe that in this logical conclusion of this idea, which is hedonism or whatever, this is a simple fact. Human beings don't like pain. It is painful to engage in introspection. If it wasn't painful, Socrates would have never said the unexamined life is no life at all. It's not easy to examine your life. It's not easy to say, you know what? Okay, I'm going to look at me. I'm going to criticize me. I'm going to rip me apart in a very loving way. Then I'm going to lo- love on myself by putting the pieces back together in the proper order. You know, the ancient Greeks had a, uh, had a uh, term for this, continence, self-mastery. You know, in the, in the public, um, Socrates was talking about how you have to be just within yourself. You have to master yourself. And all that means is you have to order yourself according to what is good. You know, not according to what is bad. So slothfulness, greed, all these vain things, like the lower things he would say, that's what is bad. But if you are, you know, introspective, if you're humble, if you're moderate in your thinking, or you are not lopsided or whatever, that is what is good. That is what is is just within yourself. Critical race theory adherents and college students who box themselves into these compartments are not being just within themselves. They're being, they are the fonts, the highest parts, the zeniths of injustice. And I hate saying that about another human being. That sounds very judgmental and critical, but I simply have to speak the truth. If I was acting unjust within myself, I would want someone to say, Christian, you're messing up, dude. You are messing up. You're not doing good. You got to fix this. Because sometimes we are so obsessed with ourselves or blind to our own insecurities and our own flaws that we can't really see into our own problems, which is why I like having people say, you did this thing wrong. I want to love you and help you, but you have to do this right if you want me to help you. But they're not, they're not, they don't want that. They are being unjust to themselves by blocking that out and subordinating themselves, enslaving themselves to lower qualities. And that yeah. is the biggest problem with these people, I think. I, I think it's a big problem. I mean, uh, honestly, like even outside of uh, people that are specifically engaged in like critical race theory and living in that particular world, I think of, you know, I, I, I do coaching with people. I'm um, like one-on-one coaching. And every time I take on a new coaching client in the discovery call, before I even agree to take them on as a client, I say, I have three agreements that every single person who coaches with me has to agree to. And one of those agreements is my role as a coach is to serve you. And that is not the same thing as pleasing you because sometimes I'm going to have to tell you stuff you don't want to hear. And sometimes like when I do the discovery call too, to, to your point, like sometimes I'll kind of evaluate that people are not really ready to hear that yet. They're not ready to have that hard conversation. And so I'll say, okay, before we proceed in a coaching relationship, I want you to go do X, Y, B, and Z because I'm trying to evaluate if they're serious or not about changing or moving towards their goal or whatever. And I'll tell you 90% of the time that I do that, they never come back to me. Because they want they they're looking wow. for someone to give them the easy answer, and I I'm not I'm not going to play that game. I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna do my very best to help you get where you want to go, regardless of whether or not I think that's a good idea. But you have to come and, and want to play the game. And you know I mean what a, a lot of this for me is you know I look at these. I'm going to call them kids. I don't mean, I don't mean any offense by it because you, you are no. in a different league than, than who I'm referring <laughs> to. Right um, but, but like, I look at some of these kids that are just so engrossed in this and I'm like, 
they're just setting themselves up for failure and misery in life. First of all, because they're not really being who they are. No single person fits perfectly into one of these one of these identity groups with all the intersecting identities. It just is it's not realistic. But secondly, they're not giving themselves the gift of you said of like introspection of doing that self work. I mean, so many of us we get caught up in in um you know throughout our, our lives we get told all the reasons that we're we're not going to be successful, or all the reasons we're bad, all the reasons we're not perfect. Well, we internalize all that stuff, and I in, in my experience anyway it's only through introspection that you can say you know what yes i'm not perfect i'm not a perfect person i will never be a perfect person but i'm gonna love myself anyway and i'm gonna think i'm pretty great no matter my imperfections no matter my flaws no matter what anyone else says of me and i just look at these kids and like they're never going to get there because they can't look at themselves and and confront their imperfections no, I think this, you hit the nail right on the head. Oh, yeah, that's, that's how you say it, right? Then hammer right on the head. Well, whatever, you, you made a very good point. I'm sorry. My mind doesn't, sometimes my mind doesn't do very good with these phrases. Um, but you, you, know, you made a very good point. Um, and really, yeah, critical race theory, a lot of people think, oh, it's just some leftist idea that is dangerous. But they don't conceptualize how it is dangerous in all senses. It's dangerous on an institutional level because, you know, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure, later. Workplaces, corporate workplaces actually have critical race theory training sessions. And they were actually yeah, pretty pissed know. off. No, no, no. They, have, they were pretty mad when Donald Trump said, you know what? If you keep doing this stuff, I'm going to defund you. I'm, you're not going to get any more federal money. They were pretty like, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen? Ah. Well, I say thank God that he did that. Thank goodness. That's one of the many things he's done that's actually very good, I think, for the progression of truth in this country. Um, but, you know, uh, it, 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 it's that on an institutional level, it, it exists on a social level, but also on an individual level. Critical race theory affects how you think about yourself. Yeah. That is the biggest threat. Because if the self is tainted, what do you have to offer to the world? Your body, your being is the vessel for everything you do in this world. If you can't, if your mind is messed up, I don't care how you look, I don't care how much money you have. If your mind is messed up, you can't give us anything. That is the biggest threat. It is an existential threat. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you have activities that affirm that, like this collegiate debate stuff, which is only incidentally leftist. I mean, debate itself is not inherently leftist. It's simply an activity of, you know, discussing things in an ordered manner. But unfortunately, when you have people and the judges in this collegiate debate who were themselves believed in critical race theory and believed in certain, you know, the certain uh, the ideas, and then they call on and they can become judges and they judge people who believe in the same thing. It's a self-perpetuating cycle. So it's it's like giving an addict more of what they're addicted to. It's not good. It's not yeah. good. So we have to understand this as both an institutional threat, a social threat, and a personal threat. Because when we when we eliminate the personal threat, we can get a little. We can get beyond. I think some of the other implications of this. But when the personal threat is still remains, we're all doomed. Not to be a doomsayer here, but we're all doomed. But I have faith. I have faith is a very big part of my life, and I think even if you're not religious. You can have faith. Faith is just so important. Kierkegaard said that is the conception of things that are not apparently evident. I have faith that people will change their minds. I have faith that people can get on the right track if we give them these ideas in a very sympathetic but stern manner. We can't call them too much, but we have to tell them, you know what? You're not doing something good right here. I don't care what your political beliefs are. You don't have to be, even if you're leftist, you don't have to think that you're oppressed entirely 100% of the time to hold the values that you hold. I guess I guess you actually kind of got to do, in all honesty. But still, it's not trying to convince their political orientations. It's about trying to um, inform their thinking about themselves to a positive way. And this is why I think that psychologists like yourselves and others help, help, help people can kind of help people who are involved in critical race theory thinking and victim mentalities get better. We oftentimes don't think of people who believe in critical race theory as being able to be appealed to by a psychologist. But I think this is a very psychological thing. I think psychologists can be a very big help. So maybe the psychologists need to like get in the room and like try to combat this thing or figure out how to combat this thing with their clients or whatever. I mean, that would be a brilliant tactic in my opinion. I think it'd be a brilliant tactic. Unfortunately, the APA, which is the governing body of psychology, has gone completely woke at this point. And so yeah, I don't have a crazy. Lot of <laughs> well, it's actually, it's, it's, it's really crazy. I've actually heard I've heard um, that I, I've heard from two different people that there are actually faculty members at schools in Pennsylvania who are trying to basically um, de like kick people like kick psychologists out of the APA or like take away their license or not allow them to get licensed if they're Republicans have high level connections in the Republican Party. And any of this stuff it's like like am i living in crazy oh, town dear. because exactly. I mean, 
and for me, it's it's ironic because you know I wrote I wrote a book about using mindfulness in the workplace to kind of like de-stress and focus and achieve your goals and all this stuff. And I wrote that book before I ever understood what critical race theory was. I mean, I I kind of I had seen the inklings of it here or there. Like when I first started seeing, it was all about the microaggressions. It was all about yeah. like oh people. my. Someone, someone didn't see see me, you know, see, see me on an email, and so I'm being microaggressed against. And and so I was starting to see little things like that. But my book is essentially all about like you are not a victim of your experience. You have control over a lot of things. You need to use the things you have control over to be successful in the world. And when I started really understanding critical race theory, this was one of the saddest parts of this whole thing for me because the 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 kids that are really getting immersed in it, and I'm going to call them victims. I think they're victims of the people teaching them this nonsense. They're victims of the people teaching it in high school. They're victims of the people teaching it in college. Of their debate of their debate coaches who are teaching them that these are the best ways to win an argument. Like they're literally teaching them that they are victims of the world well if you teach someone in their formative years when their brain is literally still forming which it's still forming up until our like our mid-20s that they are a victim of the world you have set them up for a lifetime of disempowerment and that to me is just one of the saddest experiences that i could possibly i, I would not want to live a life where i was completely disempowered and i wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because again, if you, as I mentioned, if the mind is messed up, and I was just a psychologist, you you absolutely know this. As if the mind is messed up, you have nothing to offer me, unfortunately. I mean, our minds are some of the most powerful things that we possess. People, yes. is there, it, it's from which everything else comes. Our, our sentiments, our, our words, our actions. If your mind is tainted with this stuff, you'll continue to lay this. You'll continue to go through life like this. And the, my debate coach, I mean, he he did he does critical animal studies they, where he basically parses critical theory and veganism and all this kind of stuff. I that's mean, a thing? It, it, I hadn't heard thing. about this yet. Critical oh, animal studies. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so they, they can, okay, so they, this is like the status of animals in the country, whether it's in the context of meat packing or slaughterhouses, um, with the institutional power of the slaughterhouses and of the corporations that pa package them and box them up to go to those stores, they connect. They see how that's connected with you know certain social ideas of power and privilege, and they try to divine ways to fight against that. So apparently, sometimes it can be connected to patriarchy. It can be connected to uh, white supremacy. The connection between Burger King, like for example, like one of the the studies I heard a critical animal studies person do was uh, something about Burger King using uh, its its Whopper advertisements to promote white supremacy or whatever. Uh, I mean, I actually kind of read the paper. I'm like, only an academic is something as frivolous as this get airtime. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. There's critical animal studies. There's clear critical gender studies. That analyzes the entire world and the uh, experiences of all women through patriarchy, and you know, I mean, there are so many aspects of critical theory that even funny. Critical race theory is simply a, an, an aspect of a broader spectrum, as uh, I'm sure your viewers know. So, no, critical animal studies is a thing, and you'll see a lot of vegans endorse that kind of stuff. And I'm nothing against vegans. I just think that if you're gonna, I think that you have to have bigger, better arguments than that. And personally, and personally, I can never become a vegan either. I love chicken too much. <laughs> I, I love cheese too much myself. I'm never giving up cheese. Like I love cheese. Yeah. Um, and meat I could probably give up, not the cheese. Um, so I want to, I want to make sure I ask you this question while I'm thinking about it, because, you know, I went to my first CPAC last year. And one of the things that I was not expecting. When oh, I was excellent. Yeah, and I've already signed up to go to the to, to, to the one in February, so I already have my ticket. I'm very excited about it. Um, but one of the things that was striking to me about CPAC that I, I wasn't really expecting for some reason is that there were so many college students there. And now, because I understand, like, there's discounted rates for college students, they really encourage them to do it. But I, I was actually, I was really impressed by that. And it strikes me listening to you that, you know, CPAC is probably one of the, the few places that they can kind of get together with like-minded people and be themselves, because they probably aren't, you know, as welcome unless they go to, like, Liberty university or something on on their campuses where they go to more conservative campuses and so i guess my question is what what was it about your development specifically that you think led you down the path of you know really being able to stick to your guns in terms of like your conservative ideas your libertarian ideas whereas where a lot of kids when they go to college they they get sucked into this stuff very very quickly what was it about your your history that led you there yeah, this is a question I get asked a lot, and every time the answer changes a little bit um, because it's very interesting. I mean, you know, personal and human development is a very interesting thing. I think uh, 
it's a wonder because a lot of my freshmen in college have been leftist. It's a wonder that I have I haven't taken the time. I think it was my early love for philosophy. Uh, you know, I was 14 years old. And again, I'm not trying to brag or anything. I'm just telling you what, what's happened. When I was 14 years old. I, I began to have an interest in philosophy. I would watch Wisecrack videos on YouTube, 8-bit philosophy videos, you know, very uh, um, standard stuff. And I would say, okay, this is interesting stuff. And then, you know, I was kind of taken by the tide of libertarian conservatism uh, when Ron Paul ran and everything. And when Rand Paul started to come up and he began doing his thing and all that kind of stuff. When my Mike Lee, a senator from Utah, he began doing his thing. And I began reading more into the theories that they were um, exuding through their actions and through their words. I kind of got gripped by my ideology, not in a bad way, but in a very positive way, I think. And a part of my ideology was I have to always consider the other side. I mean, conservative intellectuals have been considering the other side for decades. Like William F. Buckley, he would like go and debate everyone, every single person, Gore Vidal, every person, no matter what it was. And so that openness that was conferred to me through my belief in the freedom of expression, through my readings of people like Voltaire and things of that sort, that kind of gave me a foundation in my formative years to be a little bit more critical, not in a critical race theory thing, sense, but it's not critical at all, be a little bit more honestly critical about things, about ideas, and not to become a lemming for any any side. Because even with my own beliefs, I do um, challenge some of my tenets sometimes. I do think, Christian, is this right? Can you honestly say this before people? I mean, do you believe this? And I, I do it through, I, I like to do it through the Socratic method. I also like to do it through simply, uh, simple empirical observations. And so that's what really helped me, my love for philosophy, which birthed in openness into many other ideas. And really, I'll talk to anyone. I will have intellectual jousting with anyone because I love people and I love understanding what makes people tick for other people who may be into this critical race theory stuff. Uh, they love their kind of person. <laughs> they love their idea of people. Uh, <laughs> uh, but when you go outside of that, they don't like you very much. And so I think, I think really, I think that conservatism libertarianism does lend itself to more of an openness academically. I, I, I tend to hope, though, I, I what I see with conservatives and well, more more so libertarians is it's like you live and let live, man. Like I, my whole thing is like, I don't I don't really care. I don't know that I consider myself a conservative or libertarian right now. I just consider myself right. someone that just wants to be left alone. And I don't really care what you do as long as you don't butt your nose into my business. And and I guess that's a very libertarian thing. But I guess that's kind of where I'm at right now. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, I, I, and I think it, it's it's a hard thing to wrap your head around, too, that freedom really, and this is a conversation I've been getting into, well, I'm going to say I've been yelling a lot of people about this lately. <laughs> yeah. um, like, freedom means the freedom to make different choices. And you you might make different choices than I do. And, you know, if I actually believe in this, then I'm going to I'm gonna defend your right to live however you want, whether or not I agree with it. Um, and I'm not going to try to legislate against it because that's not my place. And I just feel like, you know, and not even just on the critical race theory side of things. I mean, certainly they're, they're, they're all about authoritarianism and all about control. And if you don't buy into their ideas, you're going to be in trouble really quick. But I also yep. think just beings in general have a really hard time wrapping their head around this idea that um that if you don't agree with the way i'm living my life you're not erasing my identity <laughs> like people can make different choices right exactly exactly and, and you know so i'll give you an example here i'm gonna get in trouble with this one thing um so a lot of my more uh, very traditionalistic conservative friends they th aren't fans of trans people trans folks are have all these problems with them and look i respectfully disagree i think trans folks are fine i think i mean i think that there's oftentimes a conflation gender dysphoria and being trans those are two different things gender dysphoria is having discomfort about your identity being trans simply being a different identity than what you are biologically that's all it is very different thing but i don't think my friends who don't affirm the idea of transgender stuff are evil are transphobic i mean if they're being respectful and kind to you and if in your presence they're referring to you as your pronouns but they don't agree with what you're doing that's fine hey i you know i come from a very pentecostal family uh very spiritual warfare kind of stuff you know i'm a christian myself i'm a more i'm a more you know uh liberal christian so to speak in my doctrine my theology but you know i'm still a very strong christian but you know me being gay and being a christian has been the locus of a lot of consternation and a lot of combat well, a lot of folks are, how can you be gay and a christian what's wrong with you I don't know. and really even those people a lot of them are like you know what christian i still love you for who you are 
And so even if you disagree with my, who I am as, as he, as you know, in my sexuality, I don't think you're evil. I don't think you're wicked. I don't think you hate me. I don't think you're homophobic. I just think you have a different perception of me that doesn't have to be born from hate or fear or aversion. So, but when you're in critical race theory mode or when you're in any mode that, that conceptualizes things as zero sum, those people are always hateful. Those people are always nasty. They're always mean. They're always rotten. You can detect nastiness and rottenness very easily. And if someone is simply saying, you know, I love you and I care about you, but I just, I'm not into what you're doing. That's not nastiness. That's not a version. That's simply them being honest in a very loving way. Now, if someone's like, oh, this homosexual is evil and he needs to go to hell and God hates, you know what, F-A-G-S. Okay, that's that's pretty nasty. That's pretty raw. That's pretty messed up. Those people need to be corrected. But most people are not like that, I don't think. And so, but if you think in a very serious way as critical race theory does, you would believe that most people who think on the same spectrum are all the same. There's differentiations. There's differences. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I, I, I kind of just want to emphasize this point because this is literally a thing I filmed a video about for my locals community. I'm establishing some rules in my locals community <laughs> <laughs> because there are just some things that are kind of untenable for me. And one of them is is literally the pronoun issue. I literally uh, had a video about this earlier because my contention is that you will be respectful. You will you will show basic courtesy and respect. And right. I don't I don't particularly care if you agree with it or not, but the minute that you start purposefully using pronouns that are not the pronouns that, that people want, right. that, that's where it crosses a line for me of, of basic courtesy and, and respect. And, I, and I'm just, I'm not right. cool with it. You can disagree with all you want, but don't be a dick. Um, so right. so you know, I, I totally get what you're saying there. And I think that, again, I think that this is, this, you know, there, there are authoritarian leanings on both sides of the aisle. I think the critical race theory stuff on the left just makes it really, really overt. And one of the things, and I'm kind of going off track here, but I'm just like, this is this is where the conversation is going. So I'm going to go there and I, I, I don't think you mind. Um, but one of the things that I'm really worried about right now is that every life is about balance right? If, if something happens, there is going to be an equal and opposite reaction, right? And that's not just true with, um, you know, science, that's true with everything. So the left has gone so far into this critical race theory stuff that it's now infused everywhere. The right is starting to backlash against it. And one of the things I'm actually really concerned about, and I've seen this happen, I think really strongly, much stronger than I thought it would since the election, is that the right is going to is going overcorrect to what has been happening on the left and almost become their own little brands of authoritarian. Yeah. Uh, and this is an issue that you've experienced over the past few weeks. I've been following you. I've been watching it. No, look, there are little authoritarians on the right. Absolutely. Entirely. 100%. And those people tend to be on the more, as you said, far extreme side. Um, but the problem is when you mold any ideology off of reactionary stuff, off of reactionism, as opposed to off of a genuine basis and convictions and principles, you set yourself up to be just as terrible as your opponents are. This is why MLK held so strongly the principle of nonviolence. Whereas Malcolm X and Nation of Islam were like, you know what, we're going to carry around, we're going to have Berettas on, we're going to have AK 47s, we're going to march in the streets. They're being reactionary to the ills they perceive were going on. Whereas King was like, no, no, no. There's something higher than me involved in this process, something very special involved in this process. And I'm not going to forsake that special conviction upon which I move in this world, upon which is right, upon which is just for the sake of political expediency, for the sake of beating the other side. It's not, it's not about beating the other side. It's about being morally righteous and bearing witness to ethical truth. The right is losing that. We are losing that, and we have to reverse course because we will become yeah. them, just like the just like them, unfortunately. I, we, we yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I no, I, I, I completely agree with you. I love that. I love that you said that so, so much because I remember, you know, the day after election day, I filmed a video saying, no matter what happens, you cannot become the the monster you're fighting. You cannot become like the left because once the right becomes like the left, like all hope is lost. So far as I'm concerned, and yes. I think people are are you know people are tensions are high right now, and I kind of I kind of understand why people are having these um really kind of irrational reactions. And my greatest hope is that right. in the next several weeks, as this all plays out, um hopefully things will calm down. Um, and you know, we can try to get back to focusing on what we believe in and what we're, what we're fighting for, um, which for me, like what I believe in is, is uh, honestly like 
live your life the way you want, stay out of other people's business. Like I'm very like my, my core beliefs right now are about individual freedom, individual liberties, really strongly about like first amendment absolutism. And you know, those that's, that's what I'm fighting for. I don't know what, what you guys want, but that's, that's what I care yeah. about. <laughs> uh, Carlin, you're libertarian. I know that you don't like the, the I, I know you don't like the Libertarian Party, and I get that. I'm not a fan either. I think they are severely dysfunctional. They've gone leftward. I don't like. That's why I'm not a part of that nonsense. But I think at heart you do have a lot of Libertarian values. Just say. <laughs> I think so too. I actually read my first. I, I read Atlas Shrug for the first time um, not too long ago, actually, probably several months ago. And I, I'd that? always rebelled against reading Atlas Shrugged and those whole ideas. And then I got into it. And I was like, Oh God, this is me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I was like, I don't want to absolutely. admit it. All right. I just want to acknowledge yeah. the super chat real quick. I don't really agree with this super chat, but I'm going to acknowledge the super chat because you're supporting my channel. So I have to appreciate that. Cyrus Cherry says, uh, do you think psychiatrists lost it when they started saying being same sex attracted wasn't a mental illness? Mental health is political now. Yes, mental health is political now. No, I do not agree that being same sex attracted is a mental illness. I don't believe that's when. Oh, yeah, exactly. I, I just want to, like I said, I, just, I don't agree with it, but I want to acknowledge it because it's a super chat, and I do, I do appreciate the support. So, um, let's get right. back to. Let's get back to focusing on critical race theory. Now, we've talked a little bit about what you experienced in terms of collegiate debate, but you also wanted to explore different issues related to the workplace, which I, I actually love it when I get to talk about workplace stuff. So what like what are you seeing there and, and what are, what's kind of top of mind for you on that right now? Right. So when President Trump said we're going to defund these critical race theory or these uh, these whiteness studies or these um, grievance studies, things that are in workplaces, a lot of corporations were like, oh, my gosh, this does not reflect our values. We're sad. They were, they were basically engaging in a strategy of appeasement, just like Ch uh, uh, Chamberlain did for uh, Hitler. Not thinking that's like the same thing. Still, appeasement is appeasement and appeasement is bad. <laughs> you should actually confront ideas and critically analyze ideas and not try to you know jump through, uh, jump through hoops or cut corners to make those ideas seem a little bit more powerful. Pal 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 um, but uh, that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a lot of workplaces structure themselves around this sort of like diversity and inclusion thing, this unconscious bias training, which you've talked about, the bias training in general. It's the diversity training. Like to, You have to learn how to be with other diverse people from other ethnicities and cultures. Therefore, we're going to put you through this manual um, thing, this structured course that will help that, that you are, is required for you to be involved in this workplace, and it will help you be more tolerant. Well, number one, I don't think we should tolerate people. We should love people. That's number one. Tolerating tolerating people and loving them are very different things. We have to let that universal divine love flow from our mouths, flow from our bodies, and just we should love people and, and embrace people, even if we don't always agree with them. That's number one. Uh, number two, if someone is a bigot, putting them through the ringer like that will not change their mind. It'll alienate them even more. <laughs> number three, you're building your programs off of a false notion of who we are as individuals. You're reducing me to my identity and or my individuality. So the entire thing, which has pervaded corporate America, which has pervaded workplaces, is nothing more than a cacophony of bad in instances and bad things that will not do anything but perpetuate this critical race theory thing into a professional sense, away from academia into a professional sense. And so that's the biggest thing that's concerning to me. And my concern is that Biden and, and Harris may reinstitute that, the critical race theory funding when they get back into office, especially if they have the assent of the Democratic, of a Democratic Senate, which I hope does not happen at all. I Oh, I hope that doesn't happen too. And I'm, I'm more and more scared every single day that that it will. Actually, I posted this morning because I had reached peak frustration that I was like, I don't even care if this happens anymore because if it does, you guys deserve it for all the infighting that's going on. But <laughs> yeah. in real life, I actually don't want that to happen. I like, it, it, like I think that it's, it's you know, let's just say like 85% likely that Biden's going to be inaugurated in January. I'm still, I never count yeah. Trump out until the very end because if anything, if anyone can pull off the impossible, it's Trump. But, it, but it's pretty likely Biden's going to be the president. Um, and if, if, if that's the way it is and the House is, you know, has a small margin of being democratic we need the senate to kind of yeah. have some sort of check and sanity to this whole situation yeah. but i agree with you and one of the things that i'm i'm really afraid of is that executive order being rescinded because you know it wasn't even the first executive order that was the most effective because that just restricted it in um federal government like federal uh, fe the federal government agencies but it was the second executive order that restricted critical race theory in federal government contractors that impacts millions yep. 
and millions of people. I mean, all the staff at all universities, the staff at, you know, I mean, a lot of I, a lot of my clients are, are like marketing agencies that do work with the federal government, actually, and they couldn't do it anymore. Or like, I mean, all, all like obviously all the defense contractors, anyone that wanted that government money couldn't do it. And that saves so many people from having to go through this training. And, you know, I'm concerned about it on several different levels. I'm concerned about it. A, you know, it, it's funny because like the UK, at least like the, the the civil service in the UK has just said, we're not doing this stuff anymore because it's grossly ineffective. So there's no evidence that it works at all in terms wow. of things that actually matter to organizations. Yeah, that just happened a couple of days ago is um, the UK over the last four or five years has spent like almost half a million dollars, 370,000 pounds, but half a million dollars by our currency on this training for over 170,000 people. People. And they did this big investigation and they basically said, OK, this stuff doesn't work like it, it produces no results. We're not going to spend money on this anymore, which is what I had been saying for a while. I was wow. like, this stuff doesn't actually produce quantifiable results. Why are we wasting money um, when you could do training around communication? <sighs> right. Like how I've always approached um, training or at least like diversity training. Anytime I've been asked to do it is I'm like, OK, I'm going to come in and I'm going to teach you how each individual person communicates what their communication style is and how to communicate better with them. And that way you're going to be able to communicate with a diverse set of individuals and ideas and be respectful of each other's needs. That was how I always positioned it. So it was very much from like an individual um, perspective. But the other reason that I'm concerned about it in organizations is it fundamentally pits people against each other. Like your colleagues in an organization, it's a team. It's a team. Like your debate, like your debate partner is like that's a team. You have to work together. And if you're teaching people to call people out for being racist over stupid right. nonsense microaggressions, that's not going to facilitate team cohesion. No, it's going to just cause a belligerence to to rain forth, and it's going to it's going to cause more conflicts than it will anything that will actually that actually harms the workplace. It actually harms the, the the functionality of the business. So it's actually against the business owner's interest in many instances to do this. But again, this is what happens when we feel compelled to be bound to societal expectations as opposed to following our own internal expectations, our own institutional expectations, as opposed as, as opposed to how we want to. Do things when you are bound to a societal expectation. You basically move with the fickle whims of the people who are expecting you to do certain things. You have no rock. You have no conviction. You are feckless. You are an invertebrate. You have no backbone. I mean, I'm not trying to be cruel here, but these business owners, these corporations who cow to this stuff, are quite literally putting in jeopardy the economic capital, the social capital, the personal capital of all of their employees, of their institutions, of themselves. It is absolutely feckless. I'm not trying to rant. I turn around, no. but still, oh, it's just, it's, it, it really, it's just, it, it, it aggravates me to no end, which is why I go to a commentary because most, most of the news organizations that I'm trying to work for, I, I want to work for, they don't do this crap because they're conservative, conservative news organizations. So I couldn't stand being in a corporate environment because of how feckless and how nonsensical this crap, not going to curse, crap is. <laughs> No, I, I completely agree with you. It's, it's mind boggling. It's part of why like, I kind of backed away from doing a lot of the organizational training because I was like, I want no part of this. I'll do YouTube all day until you guys get your act together. <laughs> for you. But like right now, yeah. I'm just like, no, I don't want to be a part of it. Um, because it, it, you know, one of the things that, that strikes me about it is, um, you know, I think you mentioned this too in, in an example you talked about from your debate team where you were talking to a non-binary person, I guess, and you weren't agreeing with them, and and they and you, it sounded like you were totally respectful in terms of want, uh, using yep. their pronouns, not not you know pushing back on that, but she assumed. Oh God, I, 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 I misgendered. They assume, <laughs> I stuck with they pronouns. I didn't mean anything by it. I so, stuck with so they. Oh no, yeah, um, it's all right. But, but they assumed that because you disagreed with them, that you didn't respect their their identity as a non-binary person, even though I'm sure that the disagreement had nothing to do about their nothing. gender identity at all. And what this teaches people is like, you're looking for reasons to be offended. You're looking for reasons to say to your friends, to your family members, to your colleagues, what have you, that like, you're like you're 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 a bad person for for you for doing some minor offense that you might not even think about and that to me is like if you're if you are looking for reasons to be upset with someone right you will find reasons to be upset with them that's right right 
That's like right. if you if you didn't right. if you if you are looking for reasons to be pissed off me, God knows there are many of them. But like if you are looking at reasons to be pissed at me, you might say, Carlin, you're wearing a stupid sweater today. Like, I mean, like, okay, it's like the easiest thing in the world to find a reason to be upset about someone and find offense. And like when we actively train people to be constantly looking for offense, constantly looking for reasons that they're oppressed, you're gonna find them. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. It's basically a self-fulfilling pro- prophecy. If you say, And this is why I think a lot of New Age ideologies do have a point, which is why I like listening to psychics and everything. Because if you think something hard enough, and you can kind of bring it into reality, whether it's by the law of attraction, which is you know the, the forces of the universe bringing it in, or whether it's by you simply acting in that manner and therefore bringing it to Regardless, the principle remains the same. What you think can influence how you act and it can influence it can influence how things go and critical race theory teaches you to think in a very lower manner a very manner which influences how you act which brings about these things which can cause chaos destruction or misunderstanding so i mean there are so many different um teachers and professionals who could actually tackle this thing from so many different angles then they have to, have to be like right-living people they could psychologists gurus psychics they could all attack this kind of thinking but unfortunately it's basically a given these days it's basically a given that you know this kind of stuff is how we do this the status quo and they're forced to stay that way i think there should be a coalition of all kind of professionals who have special specialties in this area whether it's psychologists gurus psychics philosophy professors or whatever who, who haven't gone out to the woodshed get them together and have them compose a plan to get rid of this stuff to push this stuff out of the way because if they don't you're going to continue to see this insanity um, continue to go up the levers of power. I mean, we're all going to have people in in uh, the White House, Biden and Harris, or more so Harris, because Biden doesn't know what, doesn't know what day it is, much less what critical race theory is. Uh, we're going to have people in the White House. Yeah, yeah, going to people in the White House who believe basic iterations of this. I mean, Harris said there are two systems of justice in this country: direct link to the power and privilege of basically getting out of criminally crenshaws into sectionality theory. Biden said we have to um, eliminate inequities and in housing lending between minorities. We have to, by giving them more money or by attacking redlining, redlining has been illegal since the 60s. <laughs> I mean, it's, they basically account for every difference, every gulf, everything as evidence of racial inequality, when in all reality, there's actually a more benign explanation for those things. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I wonder if Kamala Harris believes that about the criminal justice system when she was attorney general of California and we're keeping people in prison oh, longer exactly. than sentence. Yep. But we don't talk we don't get to talk about that. Yep. I just have to quiet part out loud. <laughs> oh, that's sexist, Carlin. That's sexist. Don't don't you dare attack Kamala Harris. That's sexist. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a part of the I'm a part of the patriarchy for sure, for sure. Um, but no, I think it's interesting that you bring up like gurus and and spirituality and, and I mean you you define like law of attraction perfectly. Like some people think I mean people think of law of attraction in like various degrees, but at its core, it's like if you believe something in your head then you're going to act as though that's true in the real world. Yes. So if you believe I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I'm oppressed, no one, no one's going to help me be successful. Well, guess what? You're going to act like a victim in the real world rather than exactly. showing up being empowered. And, you know, you might not exactly. believe in in like the mystical and all that stuff. That's fine. But you have to, you have to be confident in your head. Like there's this thing, um, there's a book called Broadcasting Happiness uh, by Michelle okay. Jellin, who's like a positive psychology researcher. And what she found in her research and organizations is that the people who are successful in the work environment have the success mindset, which she defined as three basic things. Number one, you have to believe that that success is possible, basically that you can achieve whatever goal you have. Number two, you have to view stress as a positive thing rather than something Mm -hmm. to be feared. And number three, the more you help other people, the more likely you are to get promoted within, within a year. Like some people who help their coworkers just, just being good guys, like, like, you know, having people's backs, they're like 60% more likely to get promoted within a year than people who don't. Well, what do those three things have in common? I mean, these, these three things are directly antithetical to critical theory in any way, shape or form, because if you believe that you are an oppressed victim, well, you're probably not going to believe success is possible. If you believe that people are all always trying to oppress you, well, you're probably not seeing stress is something that's like a positive challenge and you're probably not going to go out of your way to help people either because you don't you don't believe they're ever going to help you so why would you help them it's setting people up to fail from the time they leave school throughout their entire lives and then blame everyone else for their failures instead of taking responsibility for themselves 
Absolutely. And so this is why I think that it's very interesting that you mentioned how people kind of uh, dismiss the law of attraction as hand wavy stuff. If you understand these concepts, I mean, these concepts, there's a reason they exist in the first place. I mean, yes, many people who are endowed in the new age do believe there's a mystical quality and that's, that's fine. That adds more spice to life. That, that encourages their actions to be a little bit, you know, more positive. That's fine. But even from a base scientific standpoint, as you mentioned, we, our our thoughts do dictate to a certain extent or influence significantly our actions, and but uh, and that's why I think that you can't simply use political arguments against critical race theory. You can't simply do that. Do what we're doing right now. You have to go to psychology. You have to go to spirituality. You have to go to philosophy. You have to incorporate all these things to collapse into this, this giant nexus of argumentative energy and fervor against this foul idea so that you can appeal to people in many different ways. If I can appeal to you in a psychological way, talking about how you can do things better for yourself, you now have an actionable step plan. Whereas if I can appeal to your spirituality, you now have a sort of spiritual step plan if i can appeal to your political sensibilities you now have a plan to actualize this in, in political reality so it's all about using these very differentiated topics to tie in to the single conclusion and get get people actual steps they can take in different areas of their life to actually go ahead and combat this kind of stuff so i think that it's very interesting that we have to use we, it's very important that we use this kind of stuff if we're going to beat critical race theory uh, to the punch well, let me ask you this. Did you ever have, um, like, on your debate team or maybe with other people that you went to school with or interacted with, did you have success you in have terms success of, like, terms getting of, like, through to them using some of these techniques about, you know, why their strategies weren't necessarily going to be helpful for them in the in the real world? Say again? Sorry, say again? Did you no. ever have... No, 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 sorry. Um, did you ever have success in terms of like talking to people on your debate team or that you went to school with or any of these things in terms of explaining to them why critical theory, critical race theory is not the best way to, to live your life, is not the best philosophy that you can integrate? Did you were you ever to, able to have like a breakthrough with someone on that regard? Uh, success with it? No, I talked about it, <laughs> but <laughs> not success with it. Um, Again, so the main conversation that made them think that I was a terrible person was when I talked about systemic racism and how, you know what, I'm an individual, my race does not define me, my sexuality does not define me, you need to stop letting that stuff define you and define your tract in life. You know, after that conversation, it's really funny. You know what they did? They went over to the other student coach's house, and they were like, okay, bye, Christian, nice to see you. My partner was with them. They were foolish to do this in front of her because she tells me everything. Uh, they, they went to the other person's house. And they were sitting around, you know, they were they were enjoying themselves. And they said, you know what? Christian is an Uncle Tom. He's a, I'm not going to say the, the full word, but a C-O-O-N. He's all this kind of stuff. While they were nice to my face, they're like, I cannot believe he believes this stuff. They actually said, one of them said, I believe I let him sit on my sofa and talk to me in my house. I didn't know he believed all that cra crazy stuff. All I was saying was that systemic racism is not as big of a barrier as they think it is. That's all I was saying. <laughs> That's all I was saying. And during the conversation, certain members of the team were leaving the room because they were so offended by what I was saying. So uh, I never had success with the team, but there were people, there were other rightward students who were trying to join the team and they were also caught in uncomfortable situations as well. For example, there was one right leaning student who was kind of being pressured to argue for a pro-choice position. Now in debate, you should be able to take different positions and, you know, be able to argue them regardless if you believe them or not, but they weren't just doing it as an exercise. They were doing it as a point of ideological conversion. And he was like, Christian, I'm, too, I'm not comfortable with this. This is a little bit too much for me. And there were all kinds of other stories like this. And most right-leaning students on the team left just in the same manner that I left uh, because there was such a derision towards capitalism, towards individualism, towards free thought, towards so many other things, even towards libertarianism, especially the conservatism. I mean, Mike, the coach was like, he said, Christian, Christian, he looked at me with his, with little, with little, uh, with his stern stare, Christian. Uh, I don't think a, a liber I don't think a, a Christian conservative could ever win a case in debate. I said, huh? There are some brilliant Christian conservatives out there. I mean, I may, I may not agree with them on the moral stuff entirely, but there's some brilliant ones out there. What do you mean they can't? Well, all Christian is just not going to happen. That it's the not to sound like a conspiracy, but the system is rigged. <laughs> the system is rigged in a sense. So, you know, I never had success with the ones who are already indoctrinated, but there were ones that were like, Christians, too much for me. I got to go. There were, I had success with those. Maybe you guys should form your own debate team. Uh, well, the thing is, the university still sponsors that stuff. And the thing, my, the other thing is that the university is pretty conservative. 
that I go to. It's really? pretty conservative. It, it 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 the campus is not all that left wing. Well, okay, the students are pretty conservative. The professors are not. They're not. But <laughs> but the students are pretty conservative. So it's a wonder. Oh, it's moderate. It's not like Berkeley or UCLA. It's very moderate. It's concerned compared to a lot of other universities, where some of the universities are much more radical. It's pretty moderate. We don't have a safe space on campus. Whereas I go down the street to University of West Georgia, which is like an hour or so away from me, and they have a safe space on like, like literally in the campus. This is a safe space. Do not bring these mentalities in here. Leave them at the door. I don't have that at my school. But people make their own safe spaces. They make their own coddling machines. Where, where the administration won't do it, they'll do it for them. <laughs> so it's just odd to see all this stuff play out. Well, I think that's true in life in general, too. I mean, I think like a lot of people now, I, I and I, I include the right in this, too. I think the right is, is working on creating their own little safe space right now. A lot of them are, yep. are on parlor for that specific reason is to create create a safe space and you know i mean i think that that's that's universally dangerous when you can't sit back and consider other ideas or other perspectives i think that that's that's one of the parts i enjoy about all of this the most is being able to hear from other people and i simply i don't understand people that are like just so adverse to to they, they try to shut down anyone that doesn't think like them yeah yeah um and look the right has got to it has we're having growing pains Donald Trump has really energized the right in many different ways, but it's having growing pains a little bit. Because when you energize, when you get that first shot of adrenaline, that first whatever, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, you know, getting your first job, whether it's, you know, having your first kiss, or whether it's, you know, getting involved in any kind of relationship that embodies, you know, have happiness within you, you're going to have a shot of adrenaline, you're going to have a rush. But if you don't know how to order that rush towards a productive end, you'll end up acting irrationally. A, lo a lot of the right, at least on Twitter, which is not really a good metric in the first place on Twitter. Yeah, a lot of the right is acting irrationally, and they have to stop that um, because, again, we have to exist. Whether Trump wins or whatever, we have to exist on this moment. Regardless, we have to exist beyond. We have to be bound to ideas and convictions which escape any one particular person, but. When we begin anointing people like some of these commentators, I'm not trying to attack anyone, but like Ben Shapiro, who is considered a god by some people, when we anointing people with these mantles of divinity and these hills of divinity, their words become impervious to any kind of dissent uh, on the right. If you want to be a legitimate right -wing, uh, right winger or whatever, and you know, if you don't follow what they say, you don't do what they say. You're a bad person. You're this. You're that. When, and we gotta stop the messianism. We gotta stop treating people as if they're gods. That's the biggest thing. The reactionary quality that you mentioned that you're experiencing right now is bad, but us, it comes directly from us treating pe pe people as gods. And so you have no idea how many times. I mean, it's like, I, I listen to Shapiro sometimes. I'm like, you know what? Sometimes he says, says they're fine. Sometimes he says they're not good. Whenever I, whenever I critique him, it's like, oh, you hate your this you hate Shapiro. Alger. No, 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 calm down. He is a human being, just like you and me. He's a smart human being, but he's a human being. And sometimes he makes some very arrogant and snide comments that are incorrect. It's okay to hold that position, just as it's okay for you not to listen to my commentary if you think something I say is incorrect. It's okay. It's all right. We don't have to be robots. We don't have to agree. We can be in human beings. Really, the suppression of dis of dissent is a, a destruction to our human nature. It is trying to white not, not trying to white whitewash us in a sense to be something we're not. Nice, trying to bleach who we are, bleach our ability to think, and make it into something we're not. Not we're not robots. We have the ability to think. Aristotle said the thing that distinguishes us as human beings is we can think. We can think. We can do more than just feel and see. We can think. Use your ability to think to be the best person that you can be and to be the most attentive and most academic or, or most, you know, uh, open-minded person you can be. That's all I'm saying. But saying that can be a cardinal sense in some circles. Oh, no. I mean, it, it's totally true. And I cannot even tell you how many times in the last three days that I've been told, Carlin, I knew you never left the left. You are a left. Uh, you, are, you are a secret plant from the Democratic Party. I'm like, what are we even talking about right now? Like, <laughs> like yes, I spent six months of my life doing walkaway rallies because I was a secret leftist. You got me. Congratulations. Oh, but like, yeah. okay, so, I mean, and, and it's true too, is like all idols have clay feet. Every single one of these people. <laughs> like, they're, they're, I like that. 
yeah i mean like anytime like never meet your heroes because they will inevitably disappoint you and then they lose that status the minute that you realize that they're real life human beings and you know i think that again like one of the things that's so invigorating invigorating about this whole experience for me is it's really caused me to clarify what i believe in and i think the whole experience of you know being able to to actually I, I mean meet some of these people like you know Dave Rubin or Glenn Beck or even like Brandon Strzok or any of these people who I, I I saw from afar as like these figureheads and being able to meet them in person is it, it was it's and I, I don't mean an insult to anyone but like it loses they lose their shine when you meet them in yes. person That's not to say that I think they're bad people or they're wrong I think that they're amazing I think all three of those people that I just named are some of my you know they're yeah. they're I, I put them on a very, very high pedestal. So it's not an insult, but it's Glenn like, is great. Oh, Glenn is amazing. Glenn. I mean, really like I, I have so much, like I, which is so funny about Glenn Beck. It's like my, the, one of the very vivid memories I have of my father growing up is that he hated Glenn Beck. He hated oh my. him. And so when I actually like was on his show and like got to talk to him, I was like, Glenn is awesome. Like it was, it was a weird dichotomy to deal with. Anyway, so that's a side note. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, one of the things that, that I really questioned a lot. And I, I kind of want to see if you've had the same experience here is um, I actually had this conversation with Dave Rubin specifically. I was like, do you ever feel like we're actually the ones that are wrong and crazy and that they've got something figured out that we don't like, well, what are we missing in this whole equation? Like, why is this so enticing to people? Do you ever feel like that? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Let, 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 let me be a little bit more. Okay. Um, <laughs> If you're talking about in the context who are acting as if you are morally wrong whenever you disagree with them, I am waiting for them to give me a reason to believe that I am wrong. Because again, I told you, this human interaction is about exchange. So if I'm messing up, I probably am not going to be the best assessor of me messing up that someone who is not me could be. Because you can see things that I can't see. So I need you to tell me, okay. If I'm wrong, if I'm missing something, give it to me in a coherent, rational way. Most people were like, I've been called a CIA agent before. All kind of, oh, hey, I wish the CIA would help me. I need help with my loans and stuff for college. I wish that, I, wish, I wish I was working for the CIA. I've been called all kind of crazy things with people who, with people who don't agree with me. Um, but uh, it, it's just they haven't given me rational answers as to why I'm, I'm wrong. Now, I do know on many things I probably am very wrong on many things. I think on a lot of things, I have the right idea, but I'm 20. I'm trying to work towards something. I'm trying to work towards understanding. So I never go into a situation thinking, okay, Christian, you are always right. No, because that's very closed-minded. That's very arrogant. That's very snide. I don't do that. I want to grow as a person, as a thinker, as a human being, as someone who's in this human exchange with everyone, in this political exchange, in this emotional exchange, because politics is inherently tied with our emotional senses, I believe. And this is that's either a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> So, no, I, I never doubt myself because other people are irrational. I doubt their ability, and I am disappointed in their inability to n tell me why I'm going wrong in a very coherent way. Because I want to know. I got to know. I have to know if I'm going wrong so that I can stop making those mistakes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it, it shocks me that you're 20 years old. I have to say that, like you, you, you have you, wisdom you beyond your years, and good too. Oh, thank good you. Good job to whoever raised you, because they did, they did a really good job. Um, so as an we we've kind of been going for an hour, an hour and twenty minutes now. So I want to make sure that we get all of our topics in. Um, as an aspiring kind of political commentator, and again, guys, I would definitely encourage you to subscribe to Christian's channel. His information is in the description below, and smash that like button while you're there. But as an aspiring political commentator, what are some of the things that are top of mind for you right now? My headphones went out. Let's say again. Oh, that's okay. Um, as an aspiring political commentator, what are some of the things that are top of mind for you right now? Several things. Our, I, our, how we confront the issue of race in America, how we talk about the issue of race in America, uh, which is directly linked with this critical race theory stuff. That's up by top of my mind. Um, the role of government in the securing of certain assets and resources. So, for example, there's something called civil asset forfeiture, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with or if you're always familiar with. Basically, it's when the government – yeah, it's basically when the government 
goes in without a trial and takes your resources and your property and keeps it for an indefinite period of time. That's wrong, in my opinion. I want to fight against that. Um, I really think that the culture wars are coming to a point where both sides, as you mentioned before, are becoming incredibly identical. I want to kind of give people a way to say, you know what? You can be a rational person. You can still have a certain bias. I do. But you can be a rational person and not morph into the other side in, there, in your tactics. Um, I actually made a video about this, how Joe Manchin and AOC are actually kind of the same person. But they approach things in a different way. Joe Manchin is like, well, socialism is bad. But I'll still raise your tax and take your wealth from you. But it's bad, though. No, you're, you're sort of socialist, Joe Manchin. You're just saying it in a very different way. <laughs> you're just not, you're not saying it in your name. Um, and also, uh, the biggest experiment with my career is that – or my aspiring career. I'm not making money with this yet. Hopefully, it will be soon. The biggest experiment with this is I want people to think deeper about it all kind of, I want people to think about government in a theoretical sense and then manifest the theoretical sense into a material sense. Like, not just stay in the clouds, because that's what academics do sometimes. They stay in the clouds. No, no. Get in the clouds, then bring the clouds down to earth. That's what I want to do. So I, I talk about philosophy with my commentary. That's why I talk about individualism with my commentary. I want Americans and people around the world to realize just how special they are and how they relate to politics how they relate to political situations, and how they should be the primary unit of any political decision. Not their oppressed class, not their democratic, but who they are, your red-blooded human being, human. That's what I want. So that's the biggest thing for me. And I'm not seeing that with a lot of the mainstream commentators. With a lot of people on YouTube, yeah, I'm seeing that and everything. That's good, and I'm happy. But with someone, you know, like, and I'm not trying to attack him, Shapiro, he's a smart guy. He's a smart guy, but he touts talking points. And it kind of makes me wonder, dude, why aren't you using the intelligence that you obviously have to make a effective change? Why are you saying the same thing that 10 other people on the radio or on podcasts are saying? I want to be different from that. I want to give someone, not just for the sake of being different, but for the sake of giving someone a different perspective. That's the big experiment in my career or my aspiring career at least mm -hmm. i think i think with him i mean my perception of him and i'm gonna be honest i haven't listened to him lately just because like I, i'm really trying to not listen to many people <laughs> yeah. right now because i think everyone yeah. is just so negative um yep. but my biggest perception with him is like he's so rigid in his thinking yep right he's yep. Like, rigid he does not have a flexible mind to be able to say, oh, well, it could be this, it could be that, it could be this other thing. It's like, no, it's like, no, this is this is what yep. it is, and my way is the right way, and that's the way it's going to be, and blah, 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 I'm going to talk really fast, so it makes me sound really smart and all this stuff, and, you know, you know, zipper, 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 You are blah, pulling blah, blah, blah. no punches. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, oh, I, 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 I do have a ton of respect for the guy, because I, he's he's so smart. He's so he smart, is. but I Yep. Like you, I would like to I would like to see him use that intelligence in different ways. And I kind of wonder if he's like, I think a lot of people are like really burnt out. That's I think yeah. really where we're at right now with a lot of different people doing this sort of thing. And I, I'm including yeah. myself in this. So it's not a knock on anyone. People are really burnt out because there's just been there's been too much. <laughs> this 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 has been a very tough year. Um, and so I, I, I give him a little bit of a pass on that respect, because I, I would understand why it, he would go back to the talking points that would be much easier than actually grappling yeah. um, in a more authentic way with some of the issues. Yeah, I know. And I get that. And there are some times where I'm like, well, Christian, this is a lot of stuff to cover. I'm reading the news every day. I'm getting up you know, early in the morning to read the news and do my podcast, which I try to do daily. You know, I'm, I'm on a I'm on a com I'm on a uh, radio network called Fiber Ravens, which is like a startup um, radio thing. Uh, it was made by two um, oh. syndicated radio hosts. Yeah, yeah. One of the people who made it is one, was one of Glenn Beck's chief of staff. So I've been start the blaze and everything. So I have an immense responsibility of my own thing, my own career, to try to be as consistent and productive as possible. And there are just some times where you're like, oh my god, I don't know what to think about this. My mind is just so stretched out, but I try to keep things fresh. So that's why philosophy is really good because I can always keep things fresh with these thinkers that I read or these ideas that I interact with. Cause I, I, I you know, there's an endless stream of all these things that I haven't, that many people haven't even heard of. I, didn't, I haven't even heard of many of them actually. And so when I can bring psychological insights to a certain layman sense or um, spiritual insights <clears throat> or philosophical insights in a more refined way to my viewers, I find that it, in the, through that diversification, that gives me more of a uh, staging platform to share, share, share these ideas.
Um, so I think that is probably the best way to avoid intellectual burnout, having a very diversified interest so that if you do hammer a point away a little bit too much, you can switch to another point in a different way. It's, it's, it's very good to have a bunch of lenses by which you can see things as opposed to having one rigid lens, which Shapiro, that's one of his problems, one of his problems. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that's my thing. I agree. Well, I think you've got a very promising future. I mean, listen, if this is where you're at at 20 years old, like I, I cannot wait to see you at 25 and 30. Oh, and, thank um, you. Definitely, like I want to say that you're definitely invited back on the channel anytime you want to come. I would come. love to come back. Yeah, we will. We will have many other conversations. But um, uh, is there anything else you wanted to hit on today that we haven't hit on already? <sighs> I just wanted to say thank you, Doctor. Um, thank you, Carl. Sorry. Thank you. Carl. <laughs> Sorry, it's a reflex for me to, to pay people with proper respect. Thank you, Carlin, for bringing me on your channel. I appreciate it so much. You you inspire me. I'm not honesty. I do watch you every day. Uh, I, you inspire me. You and Joshua that you're here you two together. I love that. And just thank you for letting me have a platform where I can share my voice. I can share my perspectives and my ideas. Uh, cause you know, starting out does, is, is a little bit hard, but you know, as you keep going, as you keep progressing, as you keep manifesting the reality you want, it gets not easier, but the road is less rocky, <laughs> so to speak. So, um, thank you so much for that. And I just, uh, I hope everyone subscribes to me on YouTube or looks at my podcast and everything. And beyond that, I just want people to be able to say, you know what, this guy gave me something different. This guy gave me something that touched me. If I can touch one person, I've done my job. Um, if anyone in the chat asked any questions, though, yeah, um, or something like that. I don't, they, they've, they've been kind of ta uh, chatting back and forth with each other, so not not too many questions, I think, for us at this point. Okay. At this point. That's okay. That's okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those days. You never quite know what the chat is going to give. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask the chat. I mean, if you have any questions for, for Christian, now is the time to kind of chat them in and we'll see. Um, we'll see if anything comes in, but I want to say too, I mean, you're, you're very welcome for coming on the channel. You know, I mean, for me, I think I grew, I, my channel grew so, so quickly and I was so blessed. And I mean, I frankly like lucked into a lot of it, I feel like. And uh -huh. so, um, yeah. one of the things that going to be really doing moving forward and i actually have a whole bunch of them um set up or that i'm trying to schedule is i really i want to be able to give a platform for people like you that i think have really good ideas and really interesting experiences and maybe you know you're like you might not get on one of the big shows but you can come on here and talk about it because you know i'm not i'm not the smartest person in the world i have my own perspective and i'm really i'm uh, my my primary interest has always been the human experience and different perspectives and so that's something i feel very very committed to uh moving forward so I don't think I really see questions coming in. People are mostly just talking about Biden and the election at this point. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> all right. top, of, top, top of everyone's mind. But Aviator says, hang on, I got one from Aviator. Oh, my gosh. Hang on. I can bring it up on the screen. He says, tell Christian to keep up the good fight. Definitely, Christian. I think you're you're one of the good ones. And I'm, I'm so thrilled that you're doing this. I'm th so thrilled you're putting your voice out there. And you will definitely be back on the channel in the future. Again, everyone, I definitely recommend you subscribe to Christian's channel if you have not already. If you're not already subscribed to mine, I will be bringing him back and many interesting other people back um, in the coming weeks. My next live stream is going to be on Friday at 3 p.m. So I'm starting this new thing on Fridays, at least for this week. And then the next week is Christmas and the New Year. So we'll be gone for the next two weeks. But after that, I'm going to be doing happy hour Fridays where I'm going to try to bring on a guest and we're just going to kind of sit back and maybe have a cocktail if that's your thing. If not, that's fine too. But just talk about random stuff in a really informal way. So this Friday, we will be having happy hour a little bit earlier. At 3 p.m. actually, because Mikey Harlow from Walk Away is going to be coming on the channel, and he has he has a date <laughs> later in the night. So we have to. We Mikey have to get is him awesome. I, Mikey I love is Mikey awesome. to death. Uh -huh. he, he is the best. He is one of the best people I know. So I'm looking forward to having him for happy hour on Friday. I'm looking forward to having you back, Christian, sometime in the future. Thank you absolutely. for coming on today. I'd love to. We'll, yeah, absolutely. We'll keep in touch and we'll figure that out. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Carlin. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you for, for hanging out with us for a little while today, today and I'll see you soon.